All right, welcome to my first video. I'm Evan Van Ness. You can follow me on Twitter at Evan underscore Van underscore Ness. And I'm going to start making daily videos. I'm going to aim for them to be about five minutes and we will see how this goes. So my first video today is going to be about eight reasons why the Medasha testnet incident last weekend is bullish for ETH2. So first of all, what is the Medasha testnet? It is uh, the last, it's planned to be the last multi-client testnet for ETH2 before the beacon chain goes live in a few months. And last weekend it had an incident where Prismatic's client went down and at the, at the time, Prismatic was about 62% of nodes and a little bit more validators. So that was bad. So let me talk about the eight reasons why an, a bug and an incident is actually bullish for ETH2. So reason number one is that, you know, this is obvious, right? We have one less unnecessary dependency that is gone. One less bug that can't get you on mainnet, right? Sure, that's obvious. But like, look, no other team was relying on a third party for timestamping and now Prism isn't either. So what they were doing is that they were getting time from Cloudflare and they were using that to occasionally override system time. And they are not going to be doing that anymore. As we found out, that is not a good idea. So number two, despite over 70% of the validators immediately vanishing from the network, Medaja never died, right? I, I mean, that's pretty crazy. Like, uh, at some point, uh, because of the way it happened and Prism, Prismatic issued some updates, uh, there was something like 80% of the validators were dosing the chain, like denial of service, just sending bad data, bad blocks, bl bad attestations, and yet the chain kept going. It didn't die. Now, it didn't finalize. But I mean, this is a catastrophic, catastrophic event, and yet the chain kept going. Reason number three, Medaja is finalizing again. And by the way, Medaja is how it is is named after a a subway stop in Buenos Aires, and uh, Medaja is how they they pronounce that. So you have to say the J for the double L uh, if you speak uh, Rio Platense Spanish. Anyway, Medaja is finalizing again. And, you know, despite the fact that Medaja is a test net where stakers have little incentive to update their software or to keep their validators up, right? It's a test net. It's just fake money, whatever, fake ETH. Uh, despite all that, yesterday Medaja returned to, to being justified and to finalizing. So, you know, look, it, it took longer than it would have, obviously, obviously, if this was real money, but it still happened relatively quickly and uh, the, the chain recovered. So reason number four, it will now actually be easier for ETH2 stakers to safely switch clients. ETH2 clients um, are now going to add a feature so that a, a staker can switch their database uh, from one client to another easily and safely. And so if the, if ETH2 has a client, if your ETH2 client has a bug, then you can basically just swap out clients and that you know it should make it easier to recover from things in the future and and that that's great for not only an individual staker because it'll save you some money but it's important for the network because it means that the chain will still be able to recover faster even with crazy catastrophic failures like the one we just had so number five this understood this underscored just how important client diversity is so client diversity is the idea that you have a bunch of different uh, clients implement and a client is just an implementation of the of, of the Ethereum 2 um, spec or idea really. Um, and so uh, Prismatic had something like 70% of validators on the testnet and that's actually not good and this really means that while Medaja is still running and this testnet is ongoing, stakers now have an opportunity to try out another client and you know they can try out Lighthouse, which is a Rust client, or Lodestar, or Nimbus, or uh, which is a Nim client, Lodestar is a JavaScript client, or Teku, which is a, a Java client. And so 
they'll be able to know like, hey, look, this is like th th this other client is easy to run to and I am going to be safer and protected from the network going down, which is important because if if one client has more than 33% of the network and that client goes down, then there will like that's actually the one case where you uh, you will start losing some uh, some ETH for being offline, right? So if you are not running the majority client, you're relatively protected. But if you are running the majority client, then you know you are going to lose some ETH because the way ETH two works is it knocks, it starts cutting people's balances and until it knocks enough people out of the validator set so that it has a two thirds majority again. So, like, if those were new ideas, that might have been complicated. But like the underscoring idea is that uh, it is really important that there be as much balance as possible among the different clients. And right now there are five clients, and we need to make sure that um, more clients are running uh, other, more people, more stakers are running non-Prism clients. Okay, number six uh, is look. Individual stakers now have a better idea if they should stake. I, there has been a little bit of an idea that you know everybody should stake, and you know that's not necessarily true, right? Like there is going to be some work if you are not going to be willing to get your uh, client back up in you know in a relatively quick period of time. Then you might not want to stake, right? Um, you you got to realize that. ETH2 is likely to have pretty good staking returns when it goes live, um, but there are commensurate risks. Uh, and the reason I say it's likely to have good staking returns is that the the less people stake, the higher the returns are, and then the more people stake, the the less the returns are. So there is some uh, there is some bit of uh, like incentivization to be to be staking early on. All right, reason number seven. It, client teams are now better prepared if this happens on mainnet. So all of these client teams got to practice what happens when there is a big problem on the network. So hey, it was a fire drill and it wasn't fun, but it was good real world practice to see what happens um, when there's a disaster. So number eight is clients are taking some steps to harden themselves against catastrophic events. Um, basically, the clients have now been able to see like what happens if seventy or eighty percent of the network serves them these these bad data, these bad blocks, bad blocks and attestations. So they have found out like, hey, look, there's a bottleneck in my client where if I'm getting all of these bad data, then I can just go and uh, or then the RAM will fill up or the CPU will fill up, and now I know I need to like make it a little bit better and refactor my code to improve resilience. So that's it. In short, look, this is why we test net. This is actually quite good. Everything went wrong and yet the chain stayed alive and the chain has even returned to finalizing. So that's great. And we found out that we need and are incentivized to run a bunch of different clients as e stakers. And so let's do it. All right, thanks for tuning in to my first video. I'm going to start making daily videos, I think, if there's a good response. So yeah, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank you.